open up today by returning to the first book of Romans, the first chapter. We are in the second chapter, however, there's something in the first chapter that we need to be reminded of. Um, I'm not a math person. I wish I were. I have great appreciation for mathematics. The beauty of mathematical formulations, what they reveal to us as far as computations go. I, 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 I confess I've been watching a couple video series, uh, one on astrophysics, Ooh. and one on subnuclear forces. Ooh. And I'll tell you, 90% of it is over my head as these guys even try to make it easy for the layman. Um, they throw all the, these formulas out there, calculus. Uh, if you've had calculus, I, I envy you. Um, in fact, it's an interesting thing to note. If you go back in the history of philosophers, whether they were on target or off, most of them were off target, they often had a background in mathematics. Um, so, but to get to my point, um, when a mathematician is going through his computations and things are working out properly, the one thing that they are sure to go back and do is to check the very basic fundamentals. They make sure that they have it there correctly, 2 plus 2 is 4. With all their sines and cosines and tangents and, the, and everything that mathematics is, they make sure to go back and make sure that 2 plus 2 is 4. And so we return back to the first chapter of Romans here, because especially as, as we move along, we need to be reminded of the things that Paul spoke of first. We need to be reminded of these things, because as, as we go forward, we need to see the bedrock, the foundation that these things are on. Um, most of the time when one reads, and we all read, right? Not, everybody not, we all read. Not enough though, right? Not as many nots on that one. It is necessary to return to the beginning of a piece of literature so as to remind oneself what the writing is all about. So as we progress through, it doesn't matter what it is. A piece of poetry, an essay, um, a good book of nonfiction. You, you wouldn't read fiction, would you? Mary Higgins Clark, no. Sometimes as we progress through, it might come to mind, it's like, what is all this about again? And we have to go back to the beginning to remind ourselves why that person wrote. So we read again two of the primary verses in this letter. And these are verses 16 and 17 of chapter 1. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So we need to ask ourselves, are we ashamed of our faith? If the apostle throws that out there, he's asking the, his audience in Rome, we're going to read this, are you ashamed of the gospel? Now, he's not accusing them. Remember the know each other just by reputation. But it, it is a valid statement at that point and even today, are we shamed by our own faith? The test of that is how readily we share it. If we, for example, had an opportunity to share faith with somebody, a complete stranger, a relative, Sometimes they're the ones who are most difficult to share faith with. 
somebody at work, somebody in the classroom, wherever. If we, if we draw back from that opportunity, if it runs through our minds all kinds of useless ex excuses, well, it's not a good time, uh, they're not in the mood to hear this, or I have time constraints, I can't. That is a form of shame. We are ashamed of our faith because we don't share it. We know a lot of other faiths share what they believe in out of complete obligation. They're, they're getting points with their whoever, whoever it is that they're worshiping. And so they do it out of obligation and not out of a heart's desire. You and I need to share this out of a heart's desire. Because if you and I possess the truth and know it, who in the world do we think we are not to tell others about it? Their acceptance or their rejection is on them. It is our duty, duty, a, a love duty, to bring the message to them. So the apostle questions. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel in the sense that he's saying he's not. The unspoken question that is there between the lines is he's saying to the Romans, are you? So, uh, do we know what the gospel message is? We read that this gospel, as we go further into verse 16, it is the power of God for salvation. Term power. I know this is redundant, but redundancy can be a good thing. The word power indicates the ability to effectually change something or a situation. If we are powerless, we're unable to change whatever it is that's going on, whether it be a thing, a situation, another person can't do anything. And that brings about a feeling of hopelessness sometimes, yet sometimes you and I can't do everything. Neither should we. God wields his power to change everyone who believes this gospel. This change, what is the change called? It's there in the verse. It is there in the verse. Is the power of God for what? Salvation. Power of God for salvation. That is the change. And again, reminding ourselves, salvation. We, we often just think of it in negative terms. We've been saved so, from something, right? Think of all the things we've been saved from. And we could just go on and on and on, so I just have to leave it there. We've been saved from, and we have also been saved to, to something. In this case, to someone. So, uh, what is the gospel? And everyone says, good news. Gospel means good news. Slow clap means like whoopee you know what a word means <laughs> these questions keep coming what good news i know good news bob major league baseball is finally going to get underway toward the end of july <coughs> and i i would i would slap you just maybe once or twice so anyway is that the only good news some people see on the horizon? Yes, it is. To a lot of people, that's, that's good news. How about this? The good news is Jesus, Bob. Now, now we're getting warm. Okay, we're progressing along, but that is still insufficient. How about this? To simply say Jesus is the good news, that's inadequate. For if the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, we must include more. And 
it does not take a whole lot of memory cells to remember this. And we can actually speak this with sound to other people. We must include that Jesus' death on the cross made a way for our sins to be forgiven so that we can become God's son or daughter. That's the gospel. Verse 17, for in it, what is it again? What is it again? Yes. Gospel, that God has chosen to reveal his righteousness. This reveals who he is. Does the creation reveal him? Absolutely. The, the, the one video on astrophysics, you wouldn't believe what is out there. I've commented on this before. Just the cursory knowledge that all of us have of, oh, starlight, star bright, first star I see tonight, I wish I may, and so on. Most people at night, they don't even look up. They see these little dots of light, they don't even know what they are. What is out there? It speaks to the glory of an infinitely powerful God who has a design, who's not random, who sets each one in the sky according to his own good favor. The creation reveals him. So does the conscious knowledge of right and wrong. The conscience is something that is a point of discussion but again, we see here that we have been in doubt with that, whether we know him or not. Yet exceeding all that is the blessed second person of the Trinity, Jesus, who through his sacrifice provided the power for salvation. And so for how he reveals himself, Jesus said, who has seen me, what, has seen the Father. The Father and I are one. And so, for those, for Philip who said, if we could just see the Father, that would be enough for us. And Jesus, I'm sure, in an exasperation said, Philip, has I been so long with you? He who has seen me has seen the Father. By putting our trust in the gospel of the Lord Jesus. God clothes us with his own righteousness. And we become men of faith. We become women of faith. And we are told here, as Paul quotes the prophet Habakkuk at the end of verse 17, the righteous shall live by faith. Being righteous, we are to live by faith. We don't live by luck or probability or our smarts or our talents or our personality or by who we know or by what we know or by anything that. We live by our faith. Our tiny little weak faith that oft times wavers. We, we know that's, that's true, right? Sometimes when things are going well, we feel really good about our faith. Sometimes when we get knocked down, kicked, and then spat on, and they kick the dirt in our face, our faith wavers. We all have had experiences like that, especially when we experience disappointments. Dale and I were talking earlier on about the sign of Christian maturity. Are you ready for this? You gonna write this down? Write this down in your brain. A sign of Christian maturity is growing dependency on God. That's what maturity is. We grow more and more dependent on Him. 
Yes, the world teaches us be independent, stand on your own, be who you are. You can stand against the forces that come against you. Be resolute. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. I'm a wimp. I'm a coward. I'm weak. I things get to me. Sometimes we just need to admit that as we correctly assess ourselves, we put more and more of our life and our faith and our dependencies on our Lord, on our Master. And that is returning to chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. We need to be reminded of those things. Chapter 2. As we push on to some new things, we, we need a few words of explanation. Um, three times we've read to the Jew first and also to the Greek, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You notice that, right? Okay, we, we've, known, we've done that three times. Uh, previously, we have looked at what that meant. Bob, you mean the Jews have, a, have an advantage over, in a form, yes. An advantage and a responsibility. Uh, the Jews considered, and it is true, that they were the apple of God's eye. Still do. That's another discussion point. The Jews considered being the apple of his eye, they were his chosen people. They were blessed far above and beyond any other group because it was to them that the Almighty had blessed with his scripture. The Lord, because of the faith of one man, crediting him with righteousness and made promises to him that his descendants would receive several things, one of them being, of course, the scripture. Now, do bear in mind the Jew scriptures are what you and I call the Old Testament, the original testament, the first testament, whatever, whatever you call it. Uh, when we say the law, people often think of the Ten Commandments. True, yet there are other things that the Jews were required to be in obedience of. And you could, for example, dietary laws, no pork, no, no, no nothing. Uh, when we were in Israel, we were in a restaurant, and uh, uh, it was, is that a Friday? I think it was. And so just for fun, I, I said to the guys taking our order, I said, so is there anywhere around here I could like, get a barbecue pork sandwich? And he stopped. He paused, and he looked at me, and he said, Sir, you do realize you're in Israel. And I smiled. It was lame, but I had to get someone requesting some, some, you know, pork something. So these are other things besides the Ten Commandments. We think of the other Jewish laws. In fact, you could think of the first five books of the Bible that Moses wrote as the books of the law. So when you talk about the law, sometimes you need to be a little more specific, but it was to the Jewish people that Scripture was given. Yet, what a marvelous privilege that was for them, but you and I know to whom much is given, much is required. And so to be given this, this portion, and by the Lord himself as he dwelt among them, and yet to reject that, great accountability, along with a great privilege. To have scripture, it, it is an unspeakable privilege. To have scripture makes us accountable to be obedient to that scripture. Um, 
Sometimes I, I go through a list with people. What scripture is? I say, scripture is infallible. Yes, Bob. Amen. My friend, scripture is illuminating. Oh, yes, Bob. Glory. Hallelujah. Say, scripture tells us this and this. Amen, Bob. Amen. And I say, because of all that, it has authority over our lives. And then things get quiet. Because even though we like to acclaim all these things about God's Word when it comes right down to the real nitty-gritty, as far as being obedient to what He has said to do and what not to do, now, here, when we have done what we said to the Jew first and also to the Greek, the, the Greek here could be the Greeks themselves, but of course it more broadly refers to anybody who's not a Jew, Gentiles. I think we're all Gentiles here. So the Greeks and Gentiles were not held as accountable as the Jews because they lacked scripture in one sense. So they are, are they totally excused? Ah, you know, people who don't have the Bible, Bob, how can God hold them accountable? We hear that. So, let's read here and see verses uh, 12, 12 right there, through 16. For all who sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Do you see the two groups? Do you see the Jews being referred to secondly, and Gentiles who are without scripture first? For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires they are a law to themselves even though they do not have the law they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Return to verse 12. Sinners who are Gentiles, who do not have the law, do they escape? They do not. Why? Go down to verse 14. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have it. Although not possessing the law in written form, by nature, performing a moral life, a moral lifestyle that is dictated by their God-given consciences, they have a law to be obedient to. They may not have had this, but they have it right here. They have the testimony of the creation. They have the testimony of their consciences also, which in fact becomes a law to them that they are required to be obedient to. Pause, pause. See, often we, we get the question, Bob, uh, how does God hold people accountable who have never had the scriptures? This is answering that also. Verse 15, they, the Gentiles who are without the written law but have it written on their hearts, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and 
Look at the language here. Their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. The law for them may not be on paper, but even more so, where is it written again? On their hearts. Remember, it has been a theme of what we have been doing so far in the book. Another redundancy, so they are without excuse. So they are without excuse. And their consciences either accuse them of their wrongdoing or excuse them in their right doing. It's innate. We cannot excuse it. It is true that there are those individuals out there. You, you've heard the word unconscionable. We've mentioned this before. Uh, their consciences are seared. Their consciences are, are hardened. They have hard hearts. They commit unspeakable things and it doesn't bother them. They don't even know that they've done wrong. They're simply satisfying what they needed or what they wanted at that particular time. They don't understand other people's feelings at all. You could go to some psychologist and ask them to explain it, but yet, in secular terms, that, that explanation would be inadequate because the secular people don't deal with the spiritual side. In fact, not only do they not deal with it, they deny it because they can't measure it. They can't experiment on it. But you and I know that there is a spiritual indwelling of each and every individual that is as real as everything else that we do that is explained here. Now we go back to verse 13. <clears throat> For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. You can be here, big deal. You have to be a doer. Again, we return to the story of the wise man and the foolish man. What did they both do when they heard Jesus' words? They both did what? They both, they both heard. And then they went off and built the houses of their lives. One built it on a firm foundation. He dug deep, he poured his concrete, he put in the rebar, he, he did all the things that he was supposed to do. Okay, I'm embellishing the story a little bit. He did everything that he needed to have a firm foundation. And then he built the house of his life on the words of the Lord Jesus that he was being obedient to. The other guy heard the same words went out and built his life with no foundation. The storms of life came along, and we all know whose house stood, and we all know whose house fell flat in destruction. What's the language? Great was its fall thereof. Complete obliteration. So, verse 13 again, we can hear but if we don't do, we are not justified. Justified being, being made right in God's eyes. It, it gives you pause to wonder. People who've been in church their whole life, know the Bible inside and out, have Christian friends, but have never come to that point of faith. It's like you, you just want to shake and say, what's the matter you? What? Do you? Do you not want to be justified in God's sight? Well, yeah, I do. I do all kinds of good things. And as, as we know, it's, it is not simply good deeds that gets us into heaven. They do not suffice. They are as filthy rags. It is faith. Sola fide. Faith alone. So we have here a Jew with a written law or a Gentile 
who's never heard the scriptures. We have both of them here as we start off in verse 12. For those who sin without the law, all who have sinned under the law, that's Gentile and Jew. The only important thing then is being obedient. And that is the obedience of the call of God of the Holy Scripture to do this, to do this thing. And that is repent. And I'm glad that there's opportunity now to work this in. The word repent. You know, let me back up for just a second. Sometimes the message is, love well, Jesus and everything's okay. Really? We think of the message of the old time prophets in the, in the First Testament. We think of the message of John the Baptist. We think of the message of Jesus. I'm looking for one word here. The prophets, John the Baptist, Jesus, Peter, on the day of Pentecost. They all started, and their message revolved around one word to begin with. Peter at Pentecost, after he had preached, how long was his message? A couple minutes? The crowd yelled, Sirs, what must we do? The message that the one word that Peter said, that Jesus had said, that John had said, that the prophets had said, was what? Repent. Repent. And the question is, are people willing, the fictitious friend who had been in church their whole lives, but would not be justified, will they not repent? Is, is to look at their, their own selves, their sin, the, how repugnant that is, and to rebuke it, and to turn from it, and walk from it, not on their own strength, but on the strength of God the Father. That's what John the Baptist said at the Jordan River, he's baptized, baptizing all these people, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Jesus' message, repent. Peter's message, for what, they, they asked what to do, what do we do, okay, what do we do? They were under conviction, repent. That is what obedience is, obeying that call. Only through obedience are we justified made right in the sight of God. Verse 16. On that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Do you see that expression again, that day? We've commented on that in the past couple weeks. When we hear the day of the Lord, the day of Jesus Christ, again, here that day, it's referring to the day of what? The day of judgment. On that day, according to, as Paul slips in here, according to his gospel, God does what? What does he do on that day? It's a verb. Judges. 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 What? The secrets of men, the secrets of women, the secrets of young people, boys and girls. He judges their secrets. The motives behind all the evil actions will be laid bare for all to see. The gospel, Paul's gospel, as he said, according to my gospel, our gospel too, the good news is there's a flip side to the good news. To reject Jesus' provision of salvation through his death and resurrection, to reject the power of salvation, it is therefore made of no effect. For that 
person. Friends, let's be obedient to, to the word and be doers of it and not just hearers only. We close this portion of our service by looking at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 31. Sometimes you say, well, this is not for the people in the room. Well, this is. For if we go on sinning after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. But a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of Man and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace. Strong language. Verse 30. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And that is our admonishment. And that is for us, especially as we approach communion, are we hearers? Hearing is a nice thing. As, as I remember it, 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 was, it was wonderful. But we're not talking about hearing with our ears. Remember the redundancy elsewhere in Scripture. For those who have ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the who? To the churches. Not to individuals. What the Spirit says to the churches. So, church, this is what he says to us. We cannot necessarily, as previously mentioned, a lot of the things that we stood firmly on, our social institutions, as they have been rattled and have been called into question, we must look at putting our faith in the only place where it can be.